Allison, thank you so much for joining us today for our Global Life Science Conference and conversation on Pillar 2. Really excited to have you. Thanks so much for having me. Good to see you, Chris. So um, why don't we jump right into our questions, because there's a lot to cover. And the, the first question I have is really um, when it comes to the tax rules that are being implemented around the world and, and always changing, it's no secret that it's really the, the tax department's responsibility to be on top of those rules, understand them, comply with them. But one of the, the other things that our tax functions are responsible for doing are, for, are to educate the C-suite, the board, CFOs, the audit committees, and would be really interested in your perspective on what the C-suite and the board should be focused on as it relates to Pillar 2. And what are you communicating with your stakeholders? Sure, Chris. Um, in addition to the potential impact that Pillar 2 will have on our financial results, management and the board really need to be aware of the significant complexity that Pillar 2 introduces to managing our effective tax rate. And for global organizations in particular, these tax rules place an enormous compliance burden that's further compounded during a time when tax rates around the world are generally going up. And so that is an important message to communicate to these stakeholders. And then for multinational businesses like ours, it's absolutely critical that executives at every level of the business understand how Pillar 2 will bring increased complexity and sensitivity to the geographical mix in forecasting our business results because of the specificity that the geography in where you earn your income brings to our tax rate under Pillar 2, even more so than under prior law. Thanks for that. That's interesting perspective. Why don't we dig into that a little bit further? And, you know, clearly we, we know there are no less than a couple of hundred uh, new data requirements per constituent entity that are um, starting to, to arise as it relates to Pillar 2 reporting. So how do we work with our CFOs to get those departments on board that are so critical to helping us um, deal with these data requirements? Sure, I mean, at the CFO level, it's really just about understanding and supporting our resource requirements to get after this data. And we're fortunate in that we are currently undergoing a financial systems transformation, which will better allow us to define our Pillar 2 data requirements. And this process is one that was well underway before Pillar 2 because our CFO has focused on ensuring that our financial systems meet our current and future needs. And it also helps that the executive that's leading our financial transformation spent time in a global tax department and is really fluent in our needs. So, you know, we have um, probably some manual setup that we need to do, but we're very much fortunate that we're uh, undergoing this transformation at a time where we can define those requirements. And we have brought our other um, stakeholders like the controllership and um, our HR teams along for the education to make sure that they understand what our data requirements are and what they're going to mean for for the um, organization going forward. That's really helpful. And yeah. you know, for those that maybe have not embarked on the journey yet as it relates to finance transformation, clearly um, others might just be thinking generally about staffing and budgeting requirements. Any advice you have that you know folks can think about? That, that haven't maybe started to undertake the significant transformation that, that you have within your organization? Sure, as is the case for other companies, and we're not unique in this regard, we're not really in a position to request incremental budget for Pillar 2 implementation. It's really about reprioritizing, optimizing, and training the resources that we have, which is a continuous journey. And it's not really unlike what we faced through other ta major tax reforms, like in TCJA in 2017, country by country reporting coming online, which takes on new focus for everyone now as it becomes public. Um, so I think it's it's really all about prioritization and focus and um, freeing up the resources that you have and, and retraining. And, you know, we really run our process from the center and then involve our uh, tax team around the world to 
um, be educated and then help us ultimately with the final reporting of the global information return. Thanks, and, and quite frankly, that's not the first time I've heard that we're doing more with less budget. So um, in that uh, vein, it seems like there's a really good opportunity here to implement technology. And, and so from your perspective, how might technology play a role as it relates to Pillar 2 readiness outside of the, the finance transformation elements that you already discussed? Sure, Chris. Technology plays a huge role in identifying and validating our data sources for both plan and actual results, including consolidations activity. And generally, we have a lot more detail available for actuals versus financial plan. And our consolidations data is typically at an even higher level and not always associated with specific jurisdictions, which as I noted is of critical importance in a pillar two world. Um, but what we're working on is creating access to a single source of legal entity based financial data, both in the US and in local gap. And it's a huge effort. And, it, and that part is part of our financial systems transformation that I mentioned earlier, but this is what's gonna give us what we need for pillar two. And in the meantime, we're building data standardization, collection, and mapping solutions to prepare for our import into our Pillar 2 calculation engines and ensuring our tax provision tools have sufficient granularity to feed these calculations. So, for example, we're adding categories to isolate items like our pension, liabilities, and our qualified refundable tax credits in the Pillar 2 regime, and then also tools to collect payroll and fixed assets at uh, a subledger level of detail that we wouldn't normally collect. And then finally, we're building analytics to help us validate our pillar two calculations and impacts um, as we collect that data. So that that's some of how we um, have uh, scoped out using technology to assist us in this process. It's absolutely critical. Excellent. Thanks for that. Let's shift gears a little bit to um, the rest of the business. And, you know, Global regulatory change is not new to life science. We, we know that. Um, nor is the, the fact that within life science companies, there, there's a lot of transaction related activity happening all the time. So when we think about um, Pillar 2 in the context of M&A &A strategy, uh, how okay. important is it for the tax department to be involved in issues early on in the deal process? And, and how are you thinking about that? One of our main pillars of our capital allocation strategy is to fund inorganic growth to complement and enhance our existing pipelines and, and portfolios of products. And so my team is typically anyway brought, early, brought in early to evaluate uh, M&A deals in a multidisciplinary fashion. You know, we bring our experts from several fields within tax, the lawyers, the accountants, um, the international tax experts, et cetera. Um, to really assess and model the risks and costs, including for Pillar 2 now. Um, and so that uh, the process isn't unusual. I think the complexity is higher, for sure, in a, in a Pillar 2 world. So, so I'd assume a little bit, little bit more, more modeling might need to occur um, as, as we think about ingesting, uh, you know, new organizations in, in, in the new world. So that's, uh, that, that's interesting and certainly yeah. not one that can be done late in the game, right? No, oh, no. And, you know, we've always done sophisticated deal modeling in our shop, um, but Pillar 2 really takes it to a new level to be able to understand the impact on any given transaction. So, you know, in the phases of diligence, negotiations and post acquisition, you know, I would just share like in the diligence space. Additional consideration has to be given now to the potential value of tax attributes in a Pillar 2 world, which is already speculative, and then it becomes even more complicated with Pillar 2. Um, you also have to pay special attention to your target company's existing tax incentives and attributes that may just frankly be disregarded for Pillar 2. And then you have to do the historical diligence check on things like, you know, did the target do an asset transfer during the transition period after November 30th, 2021, as you know, any transaction like that that the target undertook may need to be recharacterized under Pillar 2. Um, and then finally, in the due diligence phase, I would say a thorough review really has to be done on the target's own pillar two positions, including whether they're relying on safe harbors um, and just, you know, the rules are very complex. We need to understand how they apply to target companies. 
Um, turning to the negotiation phase, I think you know we are going to have to adjust our negotiation strategy to make sure that the pillar two impacts are taken into account and incorporated into purchase agreements. Um, you know, there's a lot more contingencies needed against potentially lost tax benefits. And again, I mentioned uh, examining, you know, liability that might arise, for example, under the Pillar 2 transition rules. And then finally, on the negotiation phase, because Pillar 2 is not fully enacted around the world, any particular acquirer that's already subject to the rules might be at a disadvantage in bidding for a target with a low effective tax rate if, for example, the other bidders are in a jurisdiction that are not yet subject to Pillar 2 rules. So that's how I see it playing out in the negotiation phase. And then finally, for post-acquisition integration, you really have to be careful how you integrate the target with your own acquiring structure um, because there could be incremental compliance obligations and you could possibly change the Pillar 2 profile of the target or the acquirer. And I'll just give a couple examples there. One. The target may, as a standalone company, not even have been subject to the Pillar 2 rules, for example, if it was below the threshold for the rules to apply, or the target may introduce an entirely new Pillar 2 jurisdiction for the acquirer that now has to be taken into account um, for the future. So those are just some of the ways we think about Pillar 2 in, um, in the M&A space. So uh, no uh, shortage of work there for sure. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. <laughs> Definitely. So, so you mentioned um, tax attributes. Let's talk about that and unpeel that um, a little bit more. So, your CFO and and actually, Allison, I've, I've I've seen you know you've commented on this within in Washington as well. Uh, your CFO told analysts that the global minimum tax, as it stands now, is quote reducing U.S. incentives for innovation and resulting in U.S.-based multinational companies paying more tax revenue to foreign governments. Clearly problematic. Can you explain this to the audience a little bit further around how Pillar 2 is intersecting with the U.S. incentives such as the R&D credit and why this is such an important issue with the life science industry that spends, oh, say, billions of dollars of uh, on, on R&D and, and, and hopes to, to benefit from that, especially, by the way, as an aside, in our current R&D capitalization uh, situation in the U.S. that we're faced now. Can, can, can you touch on that a little bit more for us from a from a Pillar 2 U.S. R&D credit perspective? Absolutely, Chris. Um, the Pillar 2 deal just simply does not protect incentives for innovation. And this is the lifeblood of the life sciences industry and their research organizations. And so without that protection, it can make it very difficult for companies to continually invest in R&D at their current levels. And that's going to potentially impact research for new medicines, treatments, and cures. And more specifically, under the Pillar 2 rules, refundable R&D credits are given preferential treatment to non-refundable credits like the U.S. R&D tax credit that you mentioned. And that makes the U.S. less competitive than other countries. And I have to say, we're still very hopeful that the U.S. Treasury will advocate for appropriate treatment of the U.S. tax credit, R&D tax credit, under the Pillar 2 rules. So that's appropriate to drive innovation. Certainly. And, you know, obviously, as organizations look to the total cost of performing R&D, and I think you just alluded to this, this could very much impact where R&D occurs, where clinical trials are occurring that already is, you know, a factor in determining where to conduct a trial. Um, in addition to, obviously, the the the, the patient uh, population that, that is being addressed. So, um, so clearly a big impact on R&D. But do you think this could also extend into manufacturing, supply chains, and you know more broadly in terms of where companies are investing. Sure, Chris. Um, I would say first of all, going back to R and D for a moment. You know, given the unfavorable treatment of the R and D credit under the Pillar Two rules, and then I would also note um, you mentioned at the moment we still have R and D capitalization in the U S. And if under the bill that is proposed, um, that we're still hopeful will move through Congress. You know, performance of uh, OUS R&D has been dropped from the expensing. And, you know, you mentioned clinical trials. And with respect to clinical trials, we actually don't have a choice from a regulatory perspective of where we perform those. Countries around the world require you to perform clinical 
trials locally. And so we think that's an unfortunate um, uh, outcome under the proposed bill with respect to that specific type of foreign R&D. Um, but also, you know, between those two things, the failure to protect the U.S. R&D credit and the um, capitalization of R&D, um, the unfortunate incentive is to actually perform that R&D outside the U.S. in jurisdictions that have refundable credits or um, more favorable treatment on deductibility. So I think that's unfortunate. Um, turning to manufacturing and supply chain. So for our industries, you know, pharmaceutical, bio, biopharmaceutical and API manufacturing facilities are highly regulated, extremely complex, expensive, and very time consuming to build. And so for example, a biopharmaceutical facility can cost $2 billion to get up and running and four years or longer to bring it online, notwithstanding the timeline to achieve regulatory approval. And for our industry, pharmaceutical IP is generally aligned with our manufacturing locations. And so once they're built, these facilities cannot easily be picked up and moved. And so, you know, that just goes to the point that, you know, income for our industry is not as mobile as one might think um, at first blush because of these regulatory requirements. And again, the fact that we've aligned our IP with, with manufacturing around the world, including in the US. Thanks for that. Allison, we really appreciate your time. There is no shortage of complexity here as it relates to pillar two from a people, process, data, and uh, and technical requirements perspective. So really appreciate your insights and speaking with us today. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Chris. Thanks again for having me.